Once again, we want to thank you for tuning in to Crossings, a ministry of Calvary Baptist Church. I'm Pastor Dwight Lapine, and I'll be your host this morning as we get started in teaching you what the Bible says, not only about eternal life, but how to get to know God daily, moment by moment, in a personal way. We trust that this connection would really help you have a peace and a joy as you come to know Him and believe in Him. Well, as you know, uh, there are many reasons and purposes that, that people uh, live for in our world. You live in a, uh, a community known for health care and lots of learning and education. I was reading there are, I believe, are at least 10 uh, colleges or universities, higher education, who have campuses in the Rochester area. You're just a few miles from uh, the Twin Cities, and there's lots of opportunity for learning and increasing knowledge. Uh, there are people in our world that that's what their life is about, is, is acquisition and, and uh, gaining uh, academic knowledge. For other people in our world, they live for pleasure, and maybe that's one of the the greatest uh, uh, appetites that our culture has is for pleasure and experiencing pleasure in all kinds of ways. Uh, for some, it's, uh, it's thrills. Uh, you live down just uh, down the road from uh, Shakopee where there's uh, uh, the amusement park there. I've taken teens there in the past and I used to like roller coasters. I don't anymore. I, I cross the age where they, they no longer, they scare me now. Uh, but some that live for, for thrills and experiences. Uh, perhaps our culture could be defined as eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Whether it be knowledge or experiences or pleasure, whatever our world tends to live for, we, we go to the Word of God, and of course, uh, the Word of God tells us there's a different purpose to all things. And if you would open your Bible with me to Romans 16, and as you turn there, and you think about Romans and the whole letter that, that Paul wrote, his epistle, and perhaps some of the most uh, uh, full verses and texts of Scripture of theology are found in Romans. In fact, perhaps some of your, your favorite verses you could think back are found in Romans. You could start all the way in Romans chapter 1, in Romans 1, 16, one of my personal favorites. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. And then we could go forward in, in Romans 3, right? Romans 3.10, as is written, there is no one righteous, no, not one. In Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And then Romans 5, what, what wonderful texts are found in Romans 5. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have Peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. In Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates his love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And we could continue, and maybe verse after verse is coming to your mind from the book of Romans. And it's a, a wonderful text. As, as Paul finishes this book, we, we come to Romans 16, and I want to read verse 25 down to the end of the chapter Romans chapter 16, verse number 25. Paul closed this wonderful book with a doxology, words of praise to God. It's his longest doxology in any of his books. Listen to what he says. Now to him who is able to strengthen you, according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but has now been disclosed and through the prophetic writings has been made known to all nations, according to the command of the eternal God, to bring about the obedience of faith to the only wise God, be glory forevermore, through Jesus Christ. Amen. As we think of our world's purposes for much of what it does, Paul brings us back to this, this with laser focus, to what it's all about. And he says here, it's all about the glory of God. He begins with now to him, and he goes on to all the things that God is able to do and does do, and then he concludes it to the only wise God be glory. Now, this exaltation of God's glory, of course, is throughout Scripture. When I think about glory, it's kind of a vague notion to me, and I don't know if you sometimes struggle with that too. You know, we're to live life to the glory of God. Well, what, what exactly does that mean? What is glory? 
And one author was helpful with this definition. Glory defined is the visible manifestation of the greatness and splendor of God. So think through that. The visible manifestation of the greatness and splendor of God. So God's greatness and splendor is being seen in some way. It's, it's observable. It, you're, you're able to see it. We could define other words, chair. We could all define chair quickly. We could define a piano quickly or a guitar or whatever. You could define, well, this is what it is. And glory is a little more difficult, but I think if we could understand it as the visible expression, being able to see something of the glory and greatness of God, be able to see His greatness in some way, to be able to, to glimpse His attributes, to glimpse His character and who He is. One, one example that you might consider would be the Grand Canyon. I've not been to the Grand Canyon. Perhaps many of this room have been there or have seen pictures back in our table. We have pictures of the Grand Canyon. And I, I'm just amazed at those pictures. As I look at those pictures, I, I marvel at them. I, and I don't know how to exactly to describe it, but it's, 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 uh, even the picture itself is awesome in the truest sense of the word. There's a, a, an awe that comes, and I've talked to other people who have been there, and to a person, they have said it's more amazing than they could imagine going in. One young man I talked to not only went to the Grand Canyon and looked over it, but he spent three days hiking through it. And he said that was even more amazing to come out afterwards, having spent all that time in it, to, to think of how big it is and how majestic it is. As you think about how great and majestic God is, as we begin to, to gaze upon Him a little bit and think of His attributes and of all the things that God is to be glorified for. We could go around the room this morning and you could share things about God that just amaze you. Maybe even this week you've been blessed in an amazing way and, and, you, and you could recollect that and you could reflect on that and you say, God has done this or this or I've seen Him do this. Of all the things that God is glorified for in Romans 16, what is the thing that Paul ends this book with? What attribute of God? If you notice in verse 27, he says, to the only wise God be glory. Paul does this in other places where it seems like his, his highest praise for God is reserved for his wisdom. You don't have to turn there, but in Jude verse 24 and 25, we hear a similar statement. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power both now and forever. Amen. He says to God alone wise, be glory and majesty. I think this text teaches us that the glory of God is most brilliantly displayed in his great wisdom. The wisdom of God. We think of the wisdom of God, it's not just that he knows everything. He sure does. But his wisdom is also the purposes and the carrying out of his wise plans. As we think about our lives, and at times we wonder, boy, is God really wise in this circumstance or this situation? I was... Uh, uh, talking with someone this morning who was, who was expressing uh, uh, their life and their situations with work. And maybe many of you have those, that experience yourself. You're, you're working through uh, trying to find employment or you've been really hit by economic situations. And at times we wonder about our stories and like, where is God at in this? What's he doing? What's he after? What's he all about? And, and this text reminds us that one of the reasons for God's great glory to be seen is in his great wisdom. He alone is wise. Think of how his wisdom is expressed in a variety of ways. We could think about creation. In Genesis chapter 19, verse 1, you know, the heavens declare what? The glory of God. Now, we, ha we may be tempted to not see the wisdom of God in the weather that we're facing but the scripture declares that, 
that even the rain and, and the snow are evidences of His grace. In Acts chapter 14, uh, He says the rain falls and there's food and joy in your stomachs. Why? Because of the Creator God. We can look and say, you know, God is wise in creation. Think of the, the details of creation. Perhaps uh, you've been to the aquarium at the Mall of America or other aquariums and you've looked at unique species of fish. You ever wonder, wow, how, what was God thinking when he made that fish? That is just the craziest looking thing I've ever seen. We, who could design that? Who could, who could design that fish to function where it functions? And the color. Some of the colors are just phenomenal. Well, guess what? There's a creator God who designed all those things. Or the way the human body works. And all of its details. And, and the unique way uh, it has to work just function in that form. Well, with any difference or any change, uh, the body could not operate as it's to operate. Well, who, who made it that way? A creator, a wise creator God. So we think of creation. But even in the scripture, bad things are seen to be, what seem to be bad things are, are seen at the hand of a creator God. Turn with me to Exodus chapter 7. And as you look at the wisdom of God even in trials of life, and perhaps the most famous opponent of God in the Old Testament is Pharaoh. He was the king of the strongest country. He had the, the greatest resources. He had God's people at his disposal. They were acting as his slaves to build his nation. Look with me in Exodus chapter 7 and verse 3. And God has given Moses instruction to go and tell Pharaoh to let his people go. And listen to what God promised to do. Okay, I want you to go and let my people go. But I will harden Pharaoh's heart. And though I multiply my signs and wonders in the land of Egypt, Pharaoh will not listen to you. Then I'll lay my hand on Egypt and bring my hosts and my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt by great acts of judgment. Turn with me just a page over to chapter 9 and verse 7. Chapter 9, verse 7. And Pharaoh sent, and behold, not one of the livestock of Israel was dead, but the heart of Pharaoh was hardened, and he did not let the people go. Notice that's a passive uh, verb, that his heart was hardened, and I think the, the illusion here is that, that God was hardening him at this juncture. Turn to chapter 14 and verse 4 of Exodus. Chapter 14 and verse 4. And they're preparing to cross the Red Sea, and God has given instruction to Moses. Uh, then the Lord said to Moses, tell the people of Israel to turn back and encamp in front of phi Herotheth, between Migdol and the sea, in front of Baal Zephon, and you shall encamp facing it by the sea. For Pharaoh will say of the people of Israel, they are wandering in the land, the wilderness has shut them in. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart. And you'll pursue them, and I will get glory over Pharaoh and over his host. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. And they did so. As you, as you follow this and throughout this, this journey, we know that Pharaoh hardened his heart. And some of the texts emphasize Pharaoh's choice to harden his heart. So I want to be clear, Pharaoh hardened his heart. But we're also told in certain verses, and the emphasis is placed on, the fact that God also hardened his heart. We might wonder, well, why would God make it harder for his people? Isn't God there to help us? Why would he make it harder? Why would he make life more difficult for them? And in Exodus 14.4, we're told, he said, I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them. Why? And I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his hosts. You see, even in the opposition and in the trial that was present, God was declaring what? A visible manifestation of his greatness and splendor. We don't have time to look this morning, but you can write this text down. Isaiah 63, 12 to 14. In the future, God would use his destruction of Pharaoh as a way to teach all the nations about his great glory. You see, even when Israel came into the land years and years later, they, they remembered and heard, oh yeah, 
That's the people and that's the God who defeated Pharaoh. You see, even in this, in this circumstance that seemed so hard and so difficult, there was no hope in it. What was God announcing? I am great. I am great. I am great. I am more powerful than the most powerful nation on this earth. I am more powerful than the most cruel ruler. I am the great God and I will get glory. Well, you might say, well, that's, that's Old Testament. Does God still work that way today? Well, turn with me to John 9, and we can look at physical ailments. And you probably remember this text well. John chapter 9, and verse 1 to 3, we see God in his glory, even in sickness and healing. John 9, we have a man who's blind from his birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned? That was a common thinking of the day. If someone was sick and had a, a malady, Perhaps there was sin in their life, uh, their parents' life. That was their instant uh, response. That was their theological explanation for it. Look what Jesus said. Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. You see, Jesus was going to display his glory to the world that day, wasn't he? He was going to show them that he was the Christ, and he was going to heal this man. Maybe you've been going through difficulties in life and you may struggle like I do seeing the glory of God in those difficult circumstances. We may wonder, well, does this mean God doesn't love me? Does this mean that God isn't who he says he is? Does this mean God is not as great as I thought he was the moment I began to follow Christ? And as we begin to work through the scripture, we begin to see, you know what? God is demonstrating his power to us, even through the trials of life. He is demonstrating his wisdom. He is demonstrating his glory in broken vessels like us so that he could be announced to the world around us as we work through those circumstances and we find God to be sufficient and we find God in his grace to comfort our souls and give us strength, and to respond in ways that the world can't understand. 1 Peter says, they ask us of the hope that's in us. Well, why do they ask us of the hope? Because we're responding to suffering differently than the world around us responds. So God's glory is the purpose of all things. His glorious wisdom is seen in all things. And lastly, this text reminds us that the glory of God's wisdom is seen most magnificently in Jesus Christ. Turn back to our text of Romans 16, and as we close today, I want you to notice how this mystery and the wisdom of God is clearly seen most magnificently in Christ. Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel, and what? The preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but has been disclosed. So as you think about how is the wisdom of God most clearly manifested? Well, it's most clearly seen in the person of Jesus Christ, in the preaching of the gospel, in the revelation of the mystery. Our world exalts mystery today. In fact, there are religions that uh, build themselves on the fact that they're secret. One famous one that you may have heard of that gets a lot of attention uh, called Scientology because some of the Hollywood elites are involved in it. And what's the whole premise? Well, the premise is you need to pay a lot of money uh, to get initiated into this secret information that will help you live your life. And if, you, if you've heard anything of Scientology, the, the, it's, a, it's a crazy idea of aliens and so forth. It, it doesn't, you're like, any, would any rational person believe this? Uh, it requires great faith, and I'm not sure what it is that they're, what information they're getting and the lots of money, but, but the idea is that this is something reserved for elite people. Uh, th- if you've heard of the Da Vinci Code and Dan Brown, well, what, what was that an attempt? An attempt to, to, to say that Christianity, as it's declared today, is not authentic Christianity, that there is really the, the secret of Christianity has been long lost, and there are these people that are guarding it. They're protecting it. Well, guess what? That's not what the Bible says is true about the mystery of Christ. You see, it was revealed in the Old Testament. Glimpses were given. 
Even all the way back in Genesis 3, we heard that what? There would be the seed of the woman would crush the serpent's head. We have God clothing Adam and Eve in the garden. And we have all these future glimpses to what? That he would do something about sin. There were some who believed it by faith. And people like Simeon and Anna were waiting for what? They were waiting for the Christ to come. And when he came, their faith was, was realized. He's here. We look back, don't we? We look back with openness. and We openly declare that Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of the mystery. In him, both Jews and Gentiles are gathered into one body. And we declare Christ. We declare a Christ who is the exaltation of the Father. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 to 3, listen to the words that are spoken to us about Christ and who Christ is and how Christ is the exact replication of the Father. Long ago at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed the heir of all things, through whom He also created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of His nature, and He upholds the universe by the word of His power. After making purification for sins, He sat down at the right hand of the majesty and I. We exalt Christ. You see, the glory of God is seen most clearly through Christ. To our world, it's a foolish message, isn't it? We're never going to be popular as Christians in the world. That's not the goal. But the goal is to do what? It's to preach Christ. God says in 1 Corinthians 1 through the pen of the Apostle Paul that the foolishness of the gospel brings the most glory to God. You're not here today if you're a believer because you were so wise and you figured it out and you made the best business decision. Because if you begin to think about the Christian message, boy, it, it, it goes against everything of our human nature. Our human nature exalts our wisdom. Our, our society exalts excellence. It exalts athletic ability and intelligence and stamina. But, but what does the gospel exalt? The gospel exalts Christ. The gospel says we're sinners and we're broken and there's nothing good in us. And the only thing we good we have is what? Is Jesus Christ. You see, the gospel itself declares the splendor of the grace of God. And it's clearly seen through the church of Jesus Christ. This is true in the Old Testament. In Psalm 86, verse number uh, 9 God says through the pen of David, all the nations you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. That's what God wanted for Israel, and that's what God wants for the church of Jesus Christ. Turn with me to one last text over in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 8 to 11. I want to zone in uh, on the church. So how does the church reveal the glory of God? In this text, connects all the dots for us. It's amazing because it connects Christ, it connects the mystery, and it connects glory. Ephesians 3, beginning of verse 8, we read, To me, this is Paul talking, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given me to preach the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and the authorities in heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord. Isn't that beautiful? You see the church. And the church, of course, is the gathering of God's people. You, me, we are the expression of the mystery of God. His glory is radiated to who? To your friends and your neighbors. Uh, this morning as you were beginning your service, you were sharing what are the, what are the opportunities we as a church are going to declare the glory of God to people around the world? How are we going to do that to children in South America? How are you going to do that to people in Rochester, Minnesota? How are you going to do that uh, in 
in greater Minnesota. How are you going to declare the glory of God, the splendor of God? You see, the church, as redeemed people who come from all different ethnicities and backgrounds and walks of life and economic situations and life experiences, come together in unity around who? Around Jesus Christ. And as their lives are transformed by the grace of God, they announce the splendor of God. Not only to our world, but in Ephesians 3 we're told, it announces it in heavenly places, even to authorities that are unseen by us. You know that God is declaring His glory through you to unseen authorities, whether these are angels here or demons who oppose God. They are announcing that God is one. They are announcing that the cross was successful. They're announcing by the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, God has called a people to himself, and as he transforms them into his likeness, they're de- demonstrating that God is great. One author stated this, don't settle for less than what Christ was raised for. If Christ was raised to do that, how should that direct my life and your life? If we think of big church, all God's people, then we think of local churches like Calvary Baptist Church, and then you start thinking about yourself. How does my purpose, which is the purpose of all created things, which is to bring God glory, how does my life accomplish that? And it, it's so neat because it's, it's in the little things. You don't have to go start a church to announce the glory of God. You don't have to uh, start a ministry to announce the glory of God. You know, we can do that in the little expressions of life. For instance, in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, a text you know, it says, whatever you do, whether you're eating or drinking, do all to what? The glory of God. You see, husbands and wives, even in the, the way we Live life together. Uh, How we speak to one another. Children, how you obey your parents. What are you doing? You can announce the glory of God. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5.9, Paul says, We make it our goal, whether absent or present with the Lord, to be what? Pleasing to Him. That's my goal in life. You see, we can announce the glory of God in the details of our life. Isaiah 26.8 We read this, Yes, Lord, walking in the way of your laws, we wait for you. Your name and renown are the desires of our heart. Isn't that beautiful? Your name, your renown, your fame is the desire of my heart. So as I go to work tomorrow, or maybe some of you later today, what are you going to do there? The way you work can announce the glory of God. The way you handle that customer's complaint, you see, can announce the glory of God. The way you respond to that trial can announce the glory of God. Thank you for tuning into our program. It's been a delight to have you. I trust that you understand a little bit more about what Jesus Christ did for you when he died on the cross. Salvation is not something that you receive because you're born into a family or because you go to church or because you're good. Salvation is a free gift, but that gift has to be received. If you have not received it, we'd like to have you take some time to talk to God and ask Him that He might be your Savior. You understand that you are a sinner, that Jesus Christ died for you, that you can know that you have eternal life by putting your trust in Christ today.